Hey, everybody, just want to welcome you to session eight of our Understanding the End Times class called The Final Empire. And just um, before we get started, just a couple things I want to say as we get going here is if you're not, so in, in, this, in this particular session, I'm going to use a reference to the book of Revelation. And if you're not in our Forerunner School, uh, I want to encourage you to join our email list at email.radicalpursuit.net. And um, I'm going to, if you do, if you join our email list, you can get our Revelation study guide. Well, it's a Revelation, it's a real short guide of how I read the book of Revelation. And I think it'll really help you. Um, I'm going to reference that in this teaching. I just wanted to say that up front. But um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. And I want to get started in this session encouraging you. Um, I know when you study the end times, it can be very, you know, I'm, I'm sure you probably have experiences. I am so confused. I don't understand what's going on. You know, I don't understand how this ties to that, especially when you get into the book of Revelation. If you don't really understand some of the structure of the book of Revelation, it can be really confusing. And so I want to encourage you, if you feel that way, I just want to say you're not alone. Uh, there are many, many of us that feel that way. Uh, but I want to encourage you, don't quit don't think, uh, you know, it's too complicated. I've got, I've got kids I've got to take care of. I'm so busy. I don't really see the practical benefit of studying the end times or the book of Revelation. I just want to say, don't quit. Stay in there. It really does pay off. And I want to open with this scripture, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. It's actually, it's actually would go so against the way we think. Because the, the natural thing we think when it comes to the end times and it comes to learning about the different beasts that Daniel saw or which are carried into the book of Revelation and then you see the harlot riding the beast and you, you know, you, the, the natural tendency for all of us to go, this is, this is weird, it's complicated, I don't see the practical benefit to it, you know, because it does take, it really does take study and it takes contemplation and it takes really deep meditation to think about some of these things and how they fit together. So I want to encourage you with this scripture verse. It's Revelation 1 verse 3 and it goes against our minds and the way we naturally think. But John was writing and he said, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. And he's talking about the prophecy being the book of Revelation and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. And I want you to see that right there. If you want to go, if you want to experience a tremendous blessing in the Lord, then John is telling you, read the book of Revelation. And it, and it sounds almost like, it just it almost defies the logic in our minds to think, okay, you're telling me if I spend time reading Revelation 17 and 18, I'm seeing this harlot writing this, seven-headed beast with ten horns and, you know, this harlot who's drunk with the, the blood of the saints and she has a golden cup full of abominations. You're telling me that's going to bless me? And it's strange. I'm telling you, God has pronounced a blessing for everyone who will read and listen to the book of Revelation. It really is built into the scriptures so that when you read it, you walk away feeling blessed. You walk away feeling, you, you just feel something about it, you, you just experience blessing. And also, I'll say this, sometimes people say, well, I just want to focus on Jesus. And I just want to focus on the person of Jesus. And I'm right there with you. I want to focus on the person of Jesus Christ as well. But think about this. In Revelation, even in verse 1, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. What is unfolded in the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Even when you get into Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, it is unfolding not so much the nature of Jesus Christ, but it's unfolding his enemies and who he's going to wage war against. It's part of 
the unfolding of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So just saying, I just want to focus on Jesus. I'm right there with you. But part of that involves understanding the empires and the enemies that are going to wage war against Christ at the end of the age. So it's very important that we understand these things. So I just want to say, don't quit. Be encouraged. You are not the only one out there that is having a hard time understanding some of the complexity of this. I mean, even my wife came in, uh, what, Angie came in on, uh, what's today, Friday? She came in on Wednesday morning, or no, Thursday morning, and she's like, okay, I just don't get some of this. Um, I don't understand this. I'm not sure I agree with, you, with what you said about here and all that. And I'm like, I, you know, and I'm just trying to just, okay, don't, don't quit, you know. I mean, she wasn't thinking about quitting, but it was, you, you come to some of this stuff and you're trying to process this and you're like, what does it mean? You know, what does this mean? Ask questions. You know, I want to say, ask questions. Write your questions down. I mean, if you're in our Forerunner School, you can ask us when we have our, our sessions. If you're not in the Forerunner School, feel free to email us. Um, there really is not a dumb question. I'm, I'm sure that if, that if you or have a question about something, someone else has that very same question. And even in, in some of the teaching and some of the writing, I just have been in this for, for such a long time that I just have assumptions, not assumptions, I have uh, there, there's so many layers to this that I just make statements and people are like, well, how did you get that and how did you get that? Well, there's, there's so many different things going on. So ask questions, think about these things, you know, really, really think about these things, meditate on them. Um, I, you know, just one of the, this is kind of funny in our house is one of the things I love to do is I, I love taking long, hot showers and I'll think about some of the things I've just read, and I'll just be meditating. And I, I just seem to get the greatest revelation taking a shower or going on a walk or whatever. But, you know, a lot of times I'll, I, Angie and Anna don't want to take a shower after me because I use all the hot water. I'm just getting this train of thinking. And, okay, how does this fit with this scripture and that fit with that scripture? And just meditating and thinking it through. I just want to encourage you to do that with the scriptures. Do that even with these, these teachings in Revelation. You know, we're... We're looking at, and in particular, in these, the last session, this session, and really for, for several sessions uh, going forward, is we're looking at Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, uh, Revelation 17 and 18, Revelation 13. I just want to encourage you, take those, what is it, four or five different chapters, uh, no, six chapters, and take those six chapters and just immerse yourself into those chapters for a month. And just read it over and over and over again. Sometimes with the scriptures, you know, we just want to go race through the Bible and read this Bible and read this chapter or whatever. And we don't really take advantage of the meditation of it. And so I just want to encourage you, these six chapters, read it over and over and over again. Ask questions. Okay, when does this happen? Who is this? How do I understand this? And, you know, you can use the notes I provided to help you, but learn it for yourself. Just learn it for yourself. It's, these truths are vital. They're vital. They're, they're not just some impractical thing for theologians and scholars and seminaries that you don't really have any practical benefit. They are vital for the times we live in. And so it's important that we have understanding of this. So anyway... Don't quit. Hang in there. You're going to learn these things. So now that having said that, let's, let's go ahead and I want to do a quick review of some of the things we've looked at in the past couple sessions. So I'm going to read Revelation 17, verse 7. And then I'm going to read uh, through 11, actually. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and, and look at that with me. But John is seeing this vision, and you know, you've read it. He sees, he's taken into a wilderness, and he sees a harlot who's riding a beast, the scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns. And he's looking at this, this vision. He's like, what on earth am I looking at? And the angel sees John kind of perplexed about him, and he's, and he's like, why do you wonder? This is verse 7. I tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. You really cannot understand Revelation, or, or you can't understand the woman who rides the beast unless you understand the beast that carries her. And so 
And, and the unfolding and the, un, and the revelation that the angel is giving to John of the woman, he first unpacks to John the revelation of the beast. And he says, the beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And so if you're familiar with Daniel, you understand the reason the Antichrist and the Antichrist kingdom is pictured as a beast is because... Uh, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel sees four beasts. It's a carryover from the book of Daniel. So it's not a, a new revelation. It's, it's part of the beast imagery that, that uh, God is unfolding to depict the Antichrist kingdom at the end of the age. And those who dwell on the earth, who's, are, are the beast that you saw was, and he is not, and he is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And I'm going to come down to... Uh, Verse 9 here, and the angel tells John, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. It's two things there. It's not, they're not the same. There's two things. The woman sits on seven mountains, and there's seven kings. And we talked about that in the last session. I'm going to focus only here on the seven kings. Five have fallen... Okay, and this, just remember from the last session is what we learn from Daniel chapter 7 is we learn that kings and kingdoms can be used interchangeably and that's what's really going on here. What, what the angel is telling John is there are seven kings or seven kingdoms um, that these different heads represent. Five kingdoms have fallen. And we looked at that last, we looked at that last uh, session, is the first kingdom, and all of these kingdoms have a special, unique relationship to the nation of Israel, because so much of Scripture is Jerusalem, Israel-centric in terms of what God is speaking. And so we looked at in the last session, the first kingdom, the first head is Egypt, the second one is Assyria, the third one is Babylon, but once you get to the third head in Revelation 17, the third kingdom, you actually, be, you actually are taken to where Daniel starts in his vision in Daniel 2 and in Daniel 7 of the lion and the gold head. And so Babylon is the third head or the third kingdom, and it's pictured in Daniel 2 as gold. The gold part of the statue is pictured in Daniel 7 as the lion with the eagle's wings. Uh, the kingdom, the fourth kingdom is Media Persia which is the silver part of the statue and the bear. The fifth kingdom is Greece, which is pictured by the bronze or the leopard. And then the sixth kingdom is Rome and is pictured by the iron and the iron monster. And so when, when, Dan, when John is shown five have fallen, when five have fallen, he's talking about Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. Five of those kingdoms have already fallen, and now he comes here and he says, one is, that's talking about the Roman Empire. So the sixth kingdom is the Roman Empire because when John was writing the book of Revelation in 95 AD, around that time, it is when the Roman Empire was, had dominion over much of Europe and, and into the heart of the Middle East. It was a worldwide empire at that time. And so John is seeing here the sixth king or the sixth kingdom is the empire of Rome. Now he says, he says one is, and he says the other has not yet come. So that means there is a seventh kingdom. It has not yet come. Okay, so at 95 AD, the, in other words, John, the angel was telling John, there is going to be another empire that's going to come at some point into the future. It has not yet come. Now notice what it says. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. Or if you really dig into the Greek, it means he must remain a short time. So what we know here is the seventh kingdom is going to be a, fu is a future kingdom that is going to be in power for a very short time. 
That's why I don't think it, it could be the British Empire or the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was in power for like 400 something years, 500 years, 400, 500 years, somewhere in there, a long period of time. And so anyway, that to me rules out the fact that it could be the Ottoman Empire or the British Empire. It is a short period of time. And that shortness would be compared to the empires of Rome and Greece and Persia and Babylon and things like that, which were in place for, for hundreds of years. So I, that's why I believe the seventh kingdom has not yet come, but it is going to come. And I believe that seventh kingdom is a revived Roman Empire. We looked at that in the last session, uh, symbolized by the iron and the clay and, and the statue and then the beast of the iron monster. And then finally, the if you read here, in verse 11, the beast which was and is not, I believe that's, that's talking about the Antichrist is going to himself, is going to die and be resurrected. Whether it's a true resurrection, I think it will be a true resurrection or a staged resurrection. He's going to die and he's going to come back to life. And when he comes back to life, he, he himself is also an eighth so, so now we see there are eight kingdoms. There's actually eight kingdoms, which I believe is the Antichrist Empire, again symbolized in, in Daniel's statue by the iron and clay toes. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth. And his, this is important here. And he comes out, I'm going to read it in the, in the New American Standard, and it says, and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. But if you actually dig into the Greek here, that word one of is the Greek word ek, which means out of. And so what we see is that the seventh kingdom or the eighth kingdom comes out of the seventh kingdom. That's really, really important. And um, in, in our interpretation is the, the eighth kingdom that's coming is going to come out of the seventh kingdom. So it's important in our interpretation to understand that. And then we'll, we'll stop there for right now. But if you have your notes for session eight, as you can see, the statue that I put in there is you see the head of gold is Babylon, the, the breast of silver is Persia, the thighs of brass are Greece, the legs of iron are Rome. The, the, you know, I put in there the, the, the revived Roman Empire is the feet of iron and clay, the seventh kingdom, and then the, ten, the toes of iron and clay are the Antichrist Empire or the eighth kingdom. And so, you know, what we have seen so far, going back to Daniel's 70-week prophecy, which, again, that is so important. It is the backbone of end-time prophecy. Uh, so much of the structure of the book of Revelation cannot be understood until we understand Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And I go into that in the Revelation Guide. You can get um, by joining our email list, or if you're in our Forerunner School, you have access to that already. But just, just showing that much of Revelation, from Revelation 6 to like Revelation 19.6, much of that takes place during that last 70th week of Daniel, the 70th week of Daniel, a seven-year period, three and a half, marked by two different periods, three and a half years of peace and safety, three and a half years known as the day of the Lord. So much of that, the framework of Revelation is fit into those that, that Daniel's 70th week. And so if you don't understand the book of Daniel and Daniel's 70-week prophecy, then you don't understand so much of the book of Revelation. And so what we have I've seen from Daniel 9.24 is that God has a six-fold purpose for the nation of Israel. And that six-fold purpose is accomplished over a 490-year a period. That 483 years of that time period have already been accomplished and God uses four empires he reveals in Daniel to accomplish those purposes for the nation of Israel, which we saw were, were uh, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. So that's kind of where we are so far in this, in this teaching. So hopefully that is making sense, more sense to you. As I'm going to explain in the next session, one of the things that is so important to understand and I see this so often, I see it so often in, pe in teachers who are talking about the Antichrist and the, the, coming, world, the coming one world government, one world economy, one world imp uh, uh, religion or whatever, is they'd never make the distinction between the Antichrist 
his seventh kingdom, and his eighth kingdom. And I think they're vastly different. And if we don't understand the distinction, it'll create confusion. And then even when people lump these things together, it'll create confusion. So if you have your notes there, I have a table here that lists out some of the differences between the seventh kingdom and the eighth kingdom. I'm going I'm to go through those real quick. And I would encourage you, just think about these things, meditate on these things as we go through it. Uh, the first thing we'll look at is the duration. How long is the seventh kingdom? I, I mean, no one knows for sure. We know what from Scripture is going to be a short time. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. You know, we don't really know exactly, but it's a short period of time. But the eighth kingdom is actually an, an even shorter period of time. Um, the eighth kingdom is a three and a half year period. So when does the seventh kingdom begin? It begins several decades before Jesus comes back. And then the eighth kingdom begins three and a half years before Jesus comes back. So some of the characteristics of the seventh kingdom, I think we're, we're seeing some of it rising up right now in our day. This idea of uh, tolerance and peace and uh, you know, we're, we're going to see, an, we're going to see the greatest prosperity the world has ever known, even greater than we've experienced now. It's going to sweep into the, all the nations, most likely, a worldwide prosperity. And then there's coming a manipulated unity movement. There is a unity movement, just like there was in the Tower of Babel, is let's unite and we're going to build ourselves a city, just like we're, this city is going to reach until the top of heaven. And this unity, this manipulated unity movement that is joining together the world and we're going to build a global city, we're going to build a global empire, that is being, that is taking place right now. So beware of a false unity movement. Um, beware of humanistic compassion. We need compassion. We need the, the shepherd's heart of Jesus but beware of humanistic compassion because this seventh kingdom is going to be marked by humanistic compassion. Equality for all. We've got to have equality and equity for all. And I'm all for everyone having equality and equity. But sometimes that is just really rooted in a false justice movement. And we're going to see a false justice movement that's going to come in. And it is going to deceive many people. That's part of the seventh kingdom in my opinion a false justice movement that is going to deceive, deceive many, many people. There's going to be this part of the seventh kingdom is going to be this, this uh, humanistic love and compassion. And, it's, and don't be deceived by that. You know, the church des desperately needs the love of God. I think this last four, four months have shown us how desperately we need God's love to, towards each other. We can't ever forget is my disciples will be known by their love. That is going to be what marks the true disciples of Jesus Christ is the love they have, not only for God, but for each other and for the world. That There is no counterfeit of the love of Jesus Christ. There's no substitute. Now, the enemy is going to try to counterfeit that love in the seventh kingdom. And you'll see that more in a minute. A characteristic of the eighth kingdom, in contrast, whereas the seventh kingdom is known by peace and safety, the, the eighth kingdom is going to be a, a kingdom of intolerance. It's going to be a kingdom that's, uh, that's led forth by a state-controlled economy using the mark of the beast. It's going to be a kingdom of forced submission. It's going to be a kingdom of totalitarianism and dictatorship. It's going to be a kingdom of great chaos. Whereas the seventh kingdom is going to unite many nations, the eighth kingdom is going to try to conquer them by a formidable military power and force. And that brings me to the next point. The, the seventh kingdom is established by uniting the nations through a prosperous economy. They're a tolerant religion, you know. You, you, you worship your way. I'm going to worship my way. I, I worship Jesus. You worship Allah. They're really the same pathway to God, this whole universalistic idea that there's going to be pushed on the nations and common legislation. But the eighth kingdom is not established by that kind of unity. The eighth kingdom is established by the Antichrist going forth, Revelation chapter 6, going forth, conquering and to conquer. The eighth kingdom is going to be known as uh, or, or established by the Antichrist, conquering the nations through a formidable 
military force in a controlled economy. Religion, the, the seventh kingdom, I've, I've said this, but I'm going to say it again, is a state-run church which merges together Islam, Christianity, and Judaism into one world religion. We'll talk about that in the next session. But as long as you are in functioning in this state-run church, you're going to have freedom of expression to worship God, worship God however you want. And I, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if this one world religion creates a Bible, quote unquote, it's not really a holy Bible, it's an unholy Bible that takes the hate speech, so to speak, out of scripture, or at least what they say is hate speech, which is defining sin as sin, is takes that out of scripture and takes, we're going to take the best out of Christianity, we're going to take the best out of Judaism, we're going to take the best out of Islam and merge them into a state-run, state-controlled Bible, unholy scripture, that's going to be the defining mark of this religion. The eighth kingdom, although, or the eighth kingdom, in contrast, is not going to be so tolerant. The eighth kingdom, every religion except the Antichrist religion is going to be destroyed. The nations are going to be forced to convert to the Antichrist and his religion, or they're going to, be, they're going to die, or they're going to be martyred. Now, that doesn't mean the entire world, but many will be martyred because they will not bow the knee to the Antichrist and his, his intolerant religion. The Antichrist will mandate for himself worship. The government of the seventh kingdom is going to be some type of a hybrid of socialism, corporatism, and technocracy. We're going to talk about those terms in the next session, but it's a hybrid of socialism, corporatism, which is big business merging together with the state to provide services and to provide products and stuff, um, and technocracy, meaning that there's going to be an elite group of technical experts, experts in technology, experts in healthcare, experts in business, experts in this and that, and there these technocrats even big tech and big business, they're going to establish uh, the, the legislation, the religion, the economy that's going to be forced up upon the nations. That's at least my opinion. That's my opinion, obviously. And the government of the Eighth Kingdom is a totalitarian dictatorship. It's going to be absolute dictatorship. There is going to be no place for tolerance. There's going to be no place for well, I, you know, I'm going to worship God this way or that way. It's going to be, you've got to comply with everything that this one dictator says must be done or else you're going to die, you're going to be persecuted. The economy in the seventh kingdom, if you read Revelation 18, it shows the economy of the seventh, of the seventh kingdom. And this economy is some kind of a hybrid of socialism and capitalism. And even, and we'll talk about this in the next session, even already... The uh, Pope Francis has been pushing in December of 2020, he got together with business leaders and he got together with other nonprofit corporations and said, we've got to create what he called inclusive capitalism and the, others have called it uh, shareholder capitalism, which is kind of a combination of capitalism and socialism that says we've got to have a new economic system that that basically creates equity between the rich and the poor. It's a hybrid of corporatism and socialism. That's what you see, I believe, in Revelation 18, is you see the, 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 the merchants of, the, of this empire, the seventh kingdom, the merchants of the seventh kingdom is, are the great men of the earth. The, 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 the merchants are wealthy beyond anything we've known, and it's, but they're... They're using that to help, help try to help, um, try to help those, the, help ease the cry of the poor that's taking place in third, more third world nations. The economy in the eighth kingdom is going to be very different than that. It's going to be state run and state controlled, using the mark of the beast to regulate buying and selling. You know, when the vaccine uh, thing came out, there was all this talk about, oh, no, it's the mark of the beast. It's the mark of the beast. And I just want to say very clearly, vaccines are not the mark of the beast. Vaccines are not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is basically saying, I'm taking, I'm pledging my undying allegiance to the Antichrist, 
And when I pledge my allegiance to him as an act of worship, then I'm going to be given a mark. And I, I believe it'll be some kind of a computerized thing implanted. That mark is going to be, allow me to buy and to sell. And those who do not have that mark are not going to be able to buy and sell. I don't believe that the mark of the beast is going to make it throughout the entire world. I believe there'll be many nations that resist it. But it is not a vaccine. If you're worried about the mark of the beast being a vaccine, it is not a vaccine, okay? It is an act of worship that you take in your body that pledges your allegiance to the actual Antichrist. So that is not yet in place, all right? So just want to say that. But it's a state-run, state-controlled economy that regulates buying and selling. The next thing here is Satan's goal in the seventh kingdom. He has a goal. He has a strategy. Satan's goal and strategy in the seventh kingdom is he wants to intoxicate the nations. And he wants to prepare the nations for the worship of the Antichrist. Because you, I mean, just think about this. The nations right now are in no place to give their allegiance to the Antichrist and just worship him right now. I mean, some are, but most are not. Satan wants to use a one-world religion that combines the best of the religions, and it says this harlot, which is a false religious movement, this harlot wants to intoxicate and make drunk the nations on her doctrines of demons. And so... Satan wants to use this harlot religion to weaken the conscience of nations, and he wants to use this harlot religion to intoxicate the nations so they'll more readily bow down to the Antichrist and worship the Antichrist and ultimately worship him, which is the goal of the eighth kingdom. That is the ultimate goal of Satan is he wants to be worshipped. Everything we're seeing in this chaos is because Satan wants the worship that belongs only to God himself through Jesus Christ. And so even you can go back and look in Isaiah 14. Uh, Ezekiel 28 is, is Lucifer, the Satan before he fell. He wanted the worship that only belonged to God himself. And the Lord is going to grant him that for a short period of three and a half months when all the nations... And I don't, again, I don't believe it's going to be every nation, but the nations are going to bow down and worship the Antichrist. And in so doing, when they worship the Antichrist, they're going to worship the dragon who's behind the Antichrist. So that's Satan's goal in these different seventh and eighth kingdoms. The scripture references, and I, I would really encourage you, read Revelation 17 and 18. I want to encourage you, Read Revelation 17 and 18, and as I show in, my, in that study God I've been referencing, that I believe that Revelation 17 through 18, about verse 20, I think it's verse 20, I believe those, that passage of Scripture is showing uh, the, the seventh kingdom. It's showing the seventh kingdom um, just prior to the last three and a half years of the age. So, so read, the seven, read Revelation 17 and 18. I know I've spent so many years, okay, what is this talking about? What does this mean? What is the harlot? What is the dragon? What is all this, the beast with seven heads? What does that mean? I've spent so much time just praying through it and asking the Lord to show me. And then it's like the light bulb went off for me one, one day when I realized, oh, the seventh kingdom is actually revealed in Revelation 17 and 18. I just want to encourage you, read Revelation 17 and 18 with that kind of a, a thinking in your mind as this is the revelation of the seventh kingdom, Revelation 17 and 18. And then the uh, scripture reference for the eighth kingdom is seen in Revelation chapter 13 when the, the, the uh, Antichrist throws off every rival and goes out conquering and to conquer to subdue the nations for 42 months or three and a half years. And so the response, the response to the seventh kingdom, the seventh kingdom is going to have incredible satanic favor on it. The nations, and it's going to be, they're going to be, the nations are going to be sucked into the seventh kingdom because of the economy. It's going to be the economic system of the seventh kingdom that is going to allure the nations to come in. It's going to produce, in my opinion, the greatest wealth we've ever seen. The greatest wealth we have ever seen is coming and uh, even though we've already seen tremendous wealth over many, you know, 
a couple hundred years has increased, and now we're probably seeing the greatest wealth we've ever seen right now, is it's going to be even more wealth is coming in. It's probably going to bring some wealth to third world nations. And many nations are going to want to unite with this seventh kingdom because of the prosperity. They're going to be allured into this by the prosperity, by the money. And it's, it's even the kings of the earth. They fornicate with this harlot. They fornicate with this religious system. They fornicate with this government. And they, they are bribed by large sums of money. And in exchange for the money, they then give the people they have influence over over to this system. And so, but the response from the nations is, to the seventh kingdom is going to be like, we are going to build a tower for ourselves that reaches into heaven. The response from the nations to the eighth kingdom is going to be vastly different. Because the Antichrist is going forth conquering to conquer. He is going to subdue by force every nation that, uh, that is, he's going to subdue, subdue by force the nations that would be part of that empire. And he's going to conquer them. And, and there's, going to be, there's going to be many nations that are going to resist the Antichrist. And they're going to wage war against him. But like it says in Revelation 13, the, the inhabitants of the world say, who is able to wage war with him? Who is able to wage war with him? He has incredible military power behind him. And so those are some of the distinctions between the seventh kingdom and the eighth kingdom. The seventh kingdom starts several decades before Jesus comes back. The Antichrist ultimately becomes the ultimate king of the seventh kingdom. And he also is the king of the eighth kingdom. And we're going to talk now about how this kingdom rises up in the earth. So if you have your notes here, we're on page three. Is I want, to re I want you to turn in your scriptures to Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. This scripture is really, really an important scripture to understand the nature of how the seventh kingdom and the eighth kingdom rise up to power. And when I saw this, it, made, it helped make so much sense of many different things but Daniel 7, verse 24 says, as for the ten horns. So, so, so in other words, Daniel is seeing this vision of the iron monster. And he's like, what does that mean? And the angel tells him, as for the ten horns on this monster, out of this kingdom, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise. And another will arise after them. If you notice here, there's a kingdom. There's ten kings that arise. Another arises after him, and he's different from the other ones, and he subdues three kings. If you really think about this, and you combine it with some other scriptures, what you see is you see five phases of the rise of the seventh and eighth kingdom. And we're going to talk about this right now to help you get some clarity on these things. Is The, the first picture you see is a revived Roman Empire. We're going to talk about all five in a minute, but the first one, phase one, is a revived Roman Empire. If you notice carefully the phrase, it says, out of this kingdom. In other words, the ten kings come out of this kingdom. That means then that the iron kingdom that was, a, that was operating in the days of Jesus and the Roman Empire, that kingdom must be revived for the ten kings to come out of that kingdom. It comes out of that kingdom. So we see a revived Roman Empire. The necessity of a revived Roman Empire. And so when the Roman Empire fell in 476 AD, that prophecy was put on, that prophecy of the Roman Empire, the Iron Kingdom, was put on a shelf for a time being until the time when the prophecy would be fulfilled. That time was at hand. And so it's so interesting when you think about Israel. Remember the Daniel 9, 24 through 27 prophecy. Israel had to be in the land. The Jewish people had to be in the land. They had to occupy Jerusalem, and they had to perform temple sacrifices for when that clock begins to tick. So thinking about that, it's so interesting to think about in 1948, when Israel became a nation, after 1,800-plus years of desolation, Israel becomes a nation. In 1950, the European Union begins to form almost in parallel with Israel being restored. And so even in the notes, I've got in here some of the, some of the details of the European Union. I'm not going to go through all of that. But 
I mean, in my opinion, the European Union is not the final ultimate uh, fulfillment of the revived Roman Empire, but it's certainly the, re the empire being revived in its infancy. It's only at the beginning of it, but it's, it is actually a beginning of the revived Roman Empire. In my opinion, that's, that's what I believe. If you look on page four in your notes, is I have a map here of the European Union, and, and when you look at the European Union and you, you look at it on a map and you compare it to the Roman Empire, the ancient Roman Empire, is what you see is that presently about one-third of the ancient Roman Empire is being revived, has been revived, is being revived. And so you see, you see that here in, uh, in, on that map. Now, I believe it's going to expand. I believe if you look at the ancient Roman Empire at its heyday in about 117 AD, is you see the ancient Roman Empire stretch from Spain throughout Europe into Turkey, into the heart of the Middle East, all the way into uh, right around Iraq. Is I believe that's going to be the boundaries uh, of the revived Roman Empire. I believe we're going to see those nations that are going to align with this seventh kingdom. Now, how will that take place? I think quite likely what could happen, and we're going to talk about this in the next session, is, the, is the, if you're familiar with the UN and their 2030 agenda and their 17 goals of sustainable development and the Great Reset, which wants to bring forth inclusive capitalism to, to create a, this hybrid of socialism and capitalism that will that will distribute the wealth of the nations into third world nations and all over the world so there's equality in economics around the world. Um, I believe that is one of the ways that this, this revived Roman Empire is going to expand. Um, so you can see that in the notes there. I know, I know in uh, 2017, page five in the notes, in 2017, we took one of the most incredible trips of my life, and I, every time I tell Angie that, she was not on that trip, so she reminds me, I wasn't on that trip, and I was like, well, it didn't even compare to our 20-year anniversary when we went to Ireland, all right? So we, the trip to Ireland was much better, but the 2017 trip to Germany, we went to teach at our good friend's uh, Bible school there in Kensington, Germany. And uh, one of the things that really stood out to me, it was so uh, interesting, is we would go to these quaint German towns, and man, do they have the best coffee ever. I'm telling you, their coffee, if only in America we could have that coffee. It is the best coffee ever. But we would go to these quaint German towns and drink these, you know, this incredible coffee and have these incredible desserts. And yeah, hopefully we can go back over there soon. But uh, we went, I just remember we went to this one cathedral, this old cathedral that bordered uh, along Germany and France, and there was, there was big, these big bullet holes from World War II that were, had, uh, you know, had gone into the walls. But I just, I just remember, and I have a picture of this in my notes, seeing this woman on a bull, this massive, well, it was massive, this statue that catches your, your, definitely catches your attention, this woman without a shirt on, you know, riding on the back of a bull, and you're like, what on earth is that? And then you go to, we went to the European Union headquarters in Strasbourg, or one of the capitals, they have two, went to the one in Strasbourg, France, and again, you see that same statue of the woman riding the bull, and you're like, what is that? It looks so, when I saw it, I was like, this looks so similar to Revelation 17, where the woman is riding on the beast. And I was saying, what is that? And so, what I realized is, that is Europa, the woman who rides on the back of, the, of Zeus, the bull. And so the note, my notes go into that, but some more detail. But everywhere, it seems like, not everywhere, but you go throughout Europe and you look on the money and you look at outside different institutions or whatever, you always see, you see I don't want to exaggerate it, but you see sometimes you see this statue of the woman riding the bull. It's like Europa, that's Europa riding on the back of Zeus. But it's so interesting to me when we're talking about the revived Roman Empire, we're talking about Revelation 17 and 18, that, that the Europa has become somewhat of a symbol of the European Union. It's, it's a very interesting, very interesting to me. You should check it out. But I think God's, you know, not God, but the enemy's trying to forecast here, this is my plan, this is my plan. So now we're on page six in the notes. 
is the second phase of the rise to power of the seventh and eighth kingdom. The second phase is ten kings arise. If you notice back in Daniel 7, 24, it says ten kings will arise. And so, in other words, there's a progressive rise to power. And the question that a lot of people have, okay, who are these ten kings? And some have said, well, they've got to be ten kings of, or ten leaders or ten nations in the European Union. Uh, one particular theory is, was uh, released in 1973 by the Club of Rome. If you're not familiar with the Club of Rome, it's a political think tank led by some of the, wor the world's wealthy elite. And their aim in this, this political think tank is to create a global government. And so in 1973, they released a, uh, a white paper showing how the, the nations of the earth could be divided into 10 different regions. Um, and I've got it in the notes. I won't go into all the details. But 10 different regions. And so some think that the 10 kings are going to be 10 regions of the earth. Uh, others think that, okay, the 10 nations are going to be 10 superpowers. Uh, like China, America, Russia, just to name a few of them, 10 superpowers are going to rise up and become the, the leaders of this global government. That's what, that's what this means. Um, so, uh, some others think that these 10 kings are going to be an Islamic caliphate, Islamic coalition that's going to restore the Islamic caliphate and conquer the world for Allah. So, there's, there's a lot of different theories out there, but I want to share with you, as we dig into this, the Ten Kings, I want to share with you what I believe is actually saying here, what it actually means. And uh, if you notice here that the, not only were the Ten Kings mentioned in uh, Daniel 7.24, but in Daniel's statue of the, of the, of the Nebuchadnezzar saw, in Daniel's statue, there was ten toes mixed of iron and clay. So the ten kings are revealed in Daniel's statue. Then you look in Revelation or in Daniel 7, there's ten horns that are on the iron monster. So they're clearly, you know, you look at it in Daniel 2, you see it in Daniel 7, you see the ten kings in Revelation 13, you see it in Revelation 17. And so there's definitely a very important thing to understand. Um, if you look at Revelation 17, verse 12, John says, or the angel tells John, the ten horns are ten kings. And then, and then you see, this is very important right here. Verse, uh, Revelation 17, verse 12, they have not yet received a kingdom. Now notice that. At the time that the seventh kingdom is in place, the ten kings have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast. So what I think this means is the ten kings do not have, uh, will not have governing authority over a nation or region until three and a half years before Jesus comes back. And we see in Revelation 13 that when the beast rises up out of the sea, that the ten horns on that beast have ten diadems, which is a kingly crown or an ornament. In other words, what we see is that, that these ten kings are not leaders of nations. They rise up in power, though. They rise up in influence, though not leading a nation, not leading a regional area. They rise up, and they, but they don't receive a kingdom. They don't receive governing authority until the Antichrist places upon their head, so to speak, a crown to begin the eighth kingdom. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense to you. So I think it can rule out the theory that the, the ten kings are ten European nations or they're ten superpower nations or ten, is, ten Islamic nations or ten regional areas. The ten kings rise up in the seventh kingdom, they have influence, they have prominence, but they don't yet have governing authority over a nation until Revelation 13 when the Antichrist goes forth conquering and to conquer and he crowns them as kings in his empire, the eighth empire. So that's a mouthful, but I, I would encourage you, go in and read the notes and, and study that. So Daniel 7.24 it goes on and says, another is going to arise after them. This one is going to speak out against the Most High. He's going to wear down the saints of the highest one. 
He's going to make alterations in times and in law. In other words, this is describing the Antichrist. So what you see is the third phase of this kingdom, third phase of the seventh kingdom rising to power, is you've, you've got the Antichrist rises up in international influence, international prominence. The Antichrist rises up in international prominence. And when he rises up in international prominence, as we see in Revelation 17.3, the Antichrist eventually becomes the king of the seventh kingdom. And becoming the king of the seventh kingdom, he brings the woman, which we talked about in the last session, is the harlot city Rome. He brings Rome into worldwide prominence so that Rome becomes the city of cities in, in all the nations. And so the Antichrist rises up in power and brings, makes Rome, I believe, the headquarter city of this seventh kingdom. And so, when the Antichrist brings Rome to world renown and the seventh kingdom becomes the apex or reaches the apex of power, the Roman Empire at that time will be fully revived. That's my opinion, is how that works, is it will be fully revived. The Antichrist, as king of the seventh kingdom, is going to unite together. We see this in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. He's going to unite together the Jews and the Arabs on the Temple Mount. And he's going to enter into a peace covenant there. He's going to make a covenant between the Jews and the Arabs. And so the world is going to rejoice. Finally, these long-lost cousins are now worshiping supposedly the same God on the Temple Mount. We know that's not true, but that's the lie many are going to be uh, believing is they're worshiping the same God on the Temple Mount. And, the, and the, we're, we're now, the, the Antichrist has brokered this peace treaty. And now with Israel being in the land, with the Jews occupying Jerusalem and now having the authority to then perform temple sacrifices, Daniel's 70th week begins uh, seven years before Jesus comes back. And let me make one, one final point here. So in the Roman Empire, in the ancient Roman Empire, Rome was established as the, as the headquarters. And then from Rome, the, the empire expanded slowly and progressively out of Rome. I think a possible scenario, and I want to just stress possible scenario. I'm not saying, I'm not dogmatic about this, but a possible scenario that could happen is now we have the European Union is beginning, is forming. One third of the empire has is, is been revived. Is, and then possibly through something like the UN's 2030 agenda and 17 goals of sustainable development and the Great Reset using inclusive capitalism and all that's involved in that, something like that could then cause the nations to expand and, and align more with the seventh kingdom. But then it's not until the Antichrist comes to power as king of the seventh kingdom, that he makes Rome, so to speak, the headquarter city of the revived Roman Empire. And so what you could, you, what you could very well see is a restoration of the, revi of the empire uh, restored in reverse. Rather than going out from Rome at the beginning, it actually encompasses many nations in that territory and even beyond that territory of the ancient Roman Empire. And then... The Antichrist brings Rome to headquarter prominence, and then the Roman Empire is fully revived. That's just a theory. That's something I think could very well happen. Now, the fourth phase of the, rest of the rise of the seventh and eighth kingdom is the Antichrist and the ten kings come to power. And we see here, this is, I, I believe, I, I put it in the notes, I believe that at the middle point, the midpoint of the tribulation, Daniel, the midpoint of Daniel's 70 week, 70th week, three and a half years before Jesus comes back, Revelation 17 and 11 says, the beast which you saw was and is not is himself also an eighth and is, out of, is one of the seven and he goes to destruction. And I already mentioned to you that the, the eighth kingdom comes out of the seventh kingdom. And so what happens then is the ten kings come to power. They come to power to rule with the Antichrist. And at that point in time, if you read Revelation 17, verse 16 and 17, 
John said, John wrote, the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot. I want you to note that. The Antichrist and the ten kings, both of them, they hate the harlot. They hate this city. They hate all that she stands for. And I'll explain why in a minute. They hate this city. And they will, they will make her desolate and naked. And they will eat her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by giving them a common purpose. And by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. Here's, the, here's what I'm thinking here. This is why I actually believe the harlot city Rome is burned by fire three and a half years before Jesus comes back. Is This is the reason why. Is the beast, the Antichrist, hates the harlot. The Antichrist hates the harlot. Why does, why does he hate the harlot so much? It's really simple. The Antichrist wants all the worship for himself. He wants no rival. He wants no competitor. He wants all of the praise and the worship not to be deflected from him, but to be given to him. And so if you read in Revelation 13 that he has authority over the nations for 42 months or three and a half years, and during that time when he has authority over the nations for three and a half years, the Antichrist will receive the worship of the nations with no other rival. And so the harlot, who is a system of religion, who is a system of, of universalism, all roads lead to God. You, if you're a Christian, a Jew, an, a Muslim, you all worship the same God. That kind of one world religion is going to be a competitor to the Antichrist receiving worship from the nations that he wants for himself alone. So that is why the Antichrist is going to hate the harlot. Because he wants to remove the competition. He wants to remove the rivalry. He wants to worship only for himself. That's why I believe three and a half years before Christ comes back, the Antichrist and the ten kings, as they go forth conquering and to conquer, as they go forth in power, as they go forth with their, their, their incredibly powerful military, which the nations look at and they say, who's able to wage war with the beast? Who is able to take him on? There has been no one in history that has had this kind of military power, the swiftness of the military power that the Antichrist has. No one has had that in history. And he's going to, at that time, I believe, he's going to destroy the seventh kingdom, establish the eighth kingdom, and then you'll see the differences that I highlighted earlier in the session. And so what happens then is the eighth kingdom then expands through war. And so what I believe happens, Revelation 6-2, the Antichrist riding on the white horse, he goes forth conquering and to conquer. He begins to wage war against the nations that comprise this, this Roman Empire, and he wants to subdue them by military force. And he goes forth conquering and to conquer. This likely means he's going to wage war from Europe all the way into Iran. The heart of the, uh, the European world and the Arab world, he's going, to he's going to wage relentless war for three and a half years to subdue those nations. Now here, here's why I believe that. L look at Revelation 13, verse 2. Revelation 13, verse 2. This is the beginning of the Eighth Empire. This is the beginning of the Eighth Empire, which lasts for th three and a half months, or three and a half years, 42 months. It's John's writing, and he says, I saw the dragon standing on the seashore, and then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. This is the beast, the Antichrist, coming up out of the sea. He has ten horns, and he has seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems. Notice that. Notice that. On his horns were ten diadems. That means the ten kings have now come to power with the Antichrist. And on his heads were blasphemous, name, blasphemous names. Verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Isn't this interesting? For all the, of us who have been studying Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, what we're seeing here is the book of Daniel is now carried in to the book of Revelation. That's why we got to understand Daniel to understand Revelation. 
And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. The beast which I saw was like the Greek empire, conquering the nations with swiftness, conquering the nations from Greece all the way into Persia, which is modern-day Iran. And his feet were like those of a bear, the Persian empire. Same, it's really almost identical territory as the Greek empire. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. His mouth is like Babylon. In other words, what we're seeing here is the Antichrist three and a half years before Jesus comes back, going forth, conquering to conquer. He's going to conquer and wage war and bring under his, his absolute intolerant regime those nations that occupied the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, and the Babylonian Empire from Spain all the way into Iran. He's going forth to conquer and bring them into submission to himself. In fact, Daniel 2.35 validates this. When Daniel saw the vision of the statue, he saw a rock that was cut out without human hands, and that rock came down from heaven, and that rock crushed the ten toes. And when it crushed the ten toes of iron mixed with clay, which is the ten kings ruling with the Antichrist, the eighth kingdom, when he crushes the eighth kingdom, notice what Daniel 2.35 says. It says, when, when that rock crushes the feet, it says that the, uh, at the very same time, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold are crushed with it, showing that when, when the Antichrist conquers the ten kings, and the Anti or when, when Jesus Christ conquers the ten kings and the Antichrist, when he crushes the eighth kingdom, that then the nations that or the territory the Antichrist and ten kings reign over and conquer for that three and a half year period is going to be the same area that the gold, silver, bronze, and iron had occupied in the Roman, Greece, Persian, and Babylonian empires. In other words, from Spain to Iran, they're going to have the dominion in that area. And so when Christ comes back and destroys the Antichrist, destroys the ten kings, at that time, that whole dominion is conquered at the very same time because it's the ruling territory that they have. You can also see the same thing in Daniel 7, in Daniel 7, 7, and Daniel 7, 19, is this last empire is going to conquer what is called the remainder with its feet. The remainder of the territory of Babylon, Babylon, Persia, Greece. It's basically saying the very same thing in different ways. Different scriptures, different ways. It's showing that it's going to be conquered in different ways. And so now what we have is when Christ comes back, Revelation 17, the ten kings and the Antichrist, they are going to wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb is going to overcome them because he is Lord of lords and he is King of kings. He's going to crush the Antichrist and his kingdom. I know we're going a little bit long, so bear with me. There's a lot to get to here. I probably have uh, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, so bear with me. Is I want, to, I want to point out here the characteristics of the iron and the clay. Hopefully it's not a preacher's 10 minutes. It's actually 10 literal minutes. But some more characteristics of the iron and the clay is when in Daniel 2.41, the angel tells them, or, or Daniel actually tells Nebuchadnezzar, in that you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, is going to be a divided kingdom. So this clay and this iron mixed together is, is symbolic of a divided kingdom. Part of the kingdom, the iron is strong. Part of the kingdom of clay is brittle. It's a, it's a picture of joining together unlikely people groups that's going to have some strength to it and it's going to have some brittleness to it. It's going to be a divided kingdom. It's never going to be a fully united kingdom. And then verse uh, Daniel 2, 43, he goes on and he says, In that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men. But what they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. This speaks of an, uh, of an alliance between unlikely people groups. And if you actually dig into the Hebrew and get into the Aramaic word here, this Aramaic word used for mixing 
with clay. This Aramaic word is actually the word Arab. That's pretty interesting. Um, that word means to mix or join together. In other words, I think what the Lord is showing us here is that there is, I think the iron mixed with clay is possibly alluding to a European Arab alliance to form the seventh and eighth kingdom. And if you think about the territory from Spain to Iran, that makes perfect sense. There's going to be this some type of alliance between the European and Arab world that's going to join together. Um, and I got more details than that in the notes. But just for the sake of time, let me just move on. In uh, the next point, phase five is the Antichrist subdues three kings. That's the last phase. Is somehow these th three of these kings, I guess, re resist him and rebel against him, and the Antichrist subdues those three kings. So those are the five phases you see in Daniel 7:24. And if you look in your notes on page nine, is you see these five phases. You see, phase one is the Roman Empire being revived. You see, phase two the ten kings. I think right now, in terms of where we are, I always like to know on the map, you are here. I think if you were looking on the map, where are we? I think right now in history, we are now between phase one and phase two. The, the European Union is the very, very, very beginning of the empire being revived, and it's the very beginning of it, but uh, the ten kings have not risen up. I believe that a, a very, uh, I don't say strong, a very possible scenario, and again, I'm not making a prediction, I'm just saying a, a very possible scenario is the, is the UN's 2030 agenda, and there's 17 goals of sustainable development, the great, eco, or the great reset from the World Economic Forum that wants to create a one-world government, a one-world economy. I think that through that, that, that territory can expand and brings us to phase two when the ten kings rise up to prominence. Then phase three, the Antichrist arises. And then phase four, the Antichrist and ten kings, or in phase three, the Antichrist becomes king of the seventh kingdom. Phase four, the Antichrist and ten kings rise to uncontested power. And then the eighth kingdom begins the last three and a half years of the age. And then finally, phase five, the Antichrist subdue, subdues three kings. So that's all in your notes. It's a mouthful. Um, there's a lot more in the notes that I'm not going into just for the sake of time. Well, what, this is what I want to close with in this session. <clears throat> is some people... And I, I used to have this idea. I used to have this idea. I used to have this idea that um, the Antichrist, this whole, this ki the kingdom of the Antichrist is going to be a worldwide empire. Every nation is going to be part of this, of this Antichrist kingdom. And so there's really no use to it. We might as well just lie down and... Let it happen, because if we resist it, aren't we resisting the sovereign will of God? I mean, isn't that really what, you know, we think is that if we resist the Antichrist and we resist the Antichrist kingdom from rising up, aren't we resisting the sovereign will of God? Well, I, I think we need to take a different look at this. Not every nation is going to be part of the Antichrist kingdom. In fact, many nations are not going to be, uh, uh, are not going to be part of it. Many nations are going to resist it. I, I think... In the seventh kingdom, the allurement of the economic prosperity is going to suck many nations into it. But it's not something the nations have to be part of. America does not have to be part of it. Uh, Brazil does not have to be part of it. Australia, Australia does not have to be part of it. You know, there are definitely nations that were part of the, the ancient Roman Empire and the Persian Empire and the Greek Empire that are sovereignly decreed in Scripture that they will be part of it. Israel will be right at the center of that. But, but it doesn't mean that every single nation is going to be part of this empire. I do not believe the Antichrist will ever have complete authority over all the nations. In fact, if you look in Scripture, I've got it in the notes. It goes into more detail. If you look in the, some of the Scriptures, you see uh, Jordan in Daniel 11. Jordan is resisting the Antichrist. And, and doesn't bow to him. You see Egypt warring against the Antichrist but being conquered. In other words, that many nations are going to resist 
the Antichrist in the Eighth Kingdom when he's coming to subdue the nations with military force, that, that um, it's not this automatic, guaranteed thing that we just have to sovereignly submit to God's sovereign will. I think God wants the church to rise up and fight against the Antichrist agenda. I think especially, I'm just talking as an American, I think in America where we're seeing the Antichrist agenda penetrating into this nation is, is we need to say no to that. Now, when I say fight, I'm not talking about physically fighting. I'm talking about praying. I'm talking about interceding. I'm talking about uh, choosing not, being like Bonhoeffer who uh, resisted the Antichrist of his day by not bowing down to the Antichrist laws. So I'm not talking about physically fighting. I'm talking about a spiritual fight conducted through prayer, conducted into our posture to say we are not going to bow the knee to legislation, to laws that are motivated by the spirit of Antichrist that lead and strip away our freedom. We're not bowing down to those laws. We should resist the Antichrist and his kingdom and not bow down to it. So just, I know we have covered a lot, even if you need to go back and listen to the message two times, three times, read the notes two times, three times, read it over, read it over. There's so much condensed into this one-hour message that, you know, it's probably going to take you some time to work through it, think through it, meditate on it, and especially if you've never heard it. If you've never heard it, you're going to probably need to read it two or three times. You know, I just want to encourage you, do it, do it. That, what I found is that there are seasons in God, and when God opens a season for you to study the end times, glean from that season as much as you can get. I mean, God will move you on to other seasons. But when you're in a season like you are right now in the Forerunner School, and perhaps you're listening online and not part of the Forerunner School, is there are seasons when God is unfolding end time revelation, and I just say go for it. Learn as much as you can when, when there's a, uh, an opportunity that God has granted and God has placed you in a season to learn about the end times. Be hungry. Be a student. Uh, be, go eagerly after this. Be like a good Berean who says, okay, I hear what you're saying, Brian. I hear what you're teaching, Brian. I see what you said in the notes. Okay, I'm going to go take what you said, and I'm going to go back into Scripture and see if I see it for myself. And if I don't see what you're teaching in, 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 in the notes and, and what you're teaching in this YouTube video, if I don't see that, I'm not going to receive it, even if it's my wife. No, I'm just kidding. But for real, you need to be a Berean to search the Scriptures out and to hold fast to what is good. Amen. In the next session, we are going to talk about, we're going to go into more detail about the seventh kingdom. We're going to go into a lot more detail on the seventh kingdom. There's so much to learn about that. So God bless you. And we, uh, I definitely encourage you, read these, read Daniel 2, 7, 9, Revelation 17, 18, and Revelation 13. Amen. God bless you.